Good afternoon. Good to hear that you all had lunch. So this is actually the best timing to have this talk because as you saw yesterday, noise, as Linda mentioned, is something that messes up with our brain. And being hungry, it's also something that's really bad. I get hangry when I get hungry. So um, yeah, I'm going to talk to you about psychology. And then you might be thinking, psychology, this is a tech conference. Why am I here to uh, listen to someone talk about psychology? I was really happy that yesterday Linda also mentioned psychology and the fact that we are all humans, right? I, I hope so. Is there anyone here who's not a human? No? Okay, all humans. Because if you are not a human, feel free to go away because this is talk is for humans. Um, so psychology. What is psychology? When you look at this word, you might think, okay, I'm going to think about my dramas and lie down and think about my past and all my, the times I cried. And when I saw this word for the first time, that's what I thought. But then I started studying something that has to do with psychology, which is called cognitive psychology. And within the boundaries of cognitive psychology, there is something called behavioral economics, which is science that explains how we make decisions. And why did I want to learn how we make decisions? Because I wanted to influence people's decisions. I would go to a meeting and then I would suggest something or I would be working with someone doing pair programming and then I would suggest, let's say a variable change of a name and people wouldn't accept. I'd be very, very frustrated because my ideas, they weren't getting accepted. And that's influencing people to make a decision or to accept an idea that I had in my mind. So I started studying behavioral economics and that's how I ended up reading those three books. I'm gonna, throughout the whole talk, I'm going to show you a little bit of what I've learned on those three books. Thinking Fast and Slow from Daniel Kahneman, which is the same author from the Noise book that Linda mentioned yesterday, Predictably Rational and Nudge, right? But before that, I want you to watch this little video. My name is Darren Brown, and the question we're considering is simple. Can we be manipulated through social pressure to commit murder. 70 people coming in here. They can't see this. Take them by the knees. 70 actors will be playing out a meticulously planned and rehearsed scenario to manipulate this man who has no idea he's being filmed. Come on, guys. What are we going to do? He's a millionaire. He's going to make sure you go to jail. This show is about how readily we hand over authorship of our lives every day. Just Whatever give him one think. big push. Can social compliance be used to make someone push a living, breathing human being to their death? Welcome to the push. All right, so has anyone watched that on Netflix? No? Yeah, good. <laughs> can we manipulate people to commit murder? So my question here is even simpler. Can we manipulate people to click, to like, to submit, to buy online? Can you be manipulated to doing all that? And we are pushed or nudged all the time to make those decisions. Before we get into all that theory, because we had lunch and you all like a bit, after lunch some people get tired and sleepy, I want to run a very quick exercise with you, which is I want you to do three things in one minute. It's really gonna be one minute, I'm, I'm keeping track here. So please stand up and let's do three things. And please do that because this is going to be something we'll get back at the end of the talk. I created a practice. I was in Atlanta one day on Martin Luther King Day and we were doing some icebreakers and I created a practice called I Have a Dream. And my dream was I have a dream that technologists look at ethics and morals as the basis for everything that's done. So what I want you to do is I want you to find someone you don't know. Don't find someone you already know that you came with. Uh, say, hi, my name is, and then ask them, what is your dream? And then pay attention to the other person's dream, not just your dream, but share with each other one of your dreams. Go ahead, one minute. Thank you. Wow, that, that's good energy. Lots of dream sharing, right? So keep that dream, the other person's dream, and your dream to yourself right now. At the end, you will get back to it. 35,000, does anyone know what that number is? It's the number of decisions you make every single day. Do you remember the 35,000 you made yesterday? 
I can't remember, like 35. Can you imagine 35,000? And the thing is, we make those decisions unconsciously. Not only we make them unconsciously, we make a lot of those decisions using digital devices. We've delegated a lot of those decisions to digital devices. When I arrived in Chicago, I went to Google and I said, where to eat in Chicago? And what do I get? I get 1,340 million results. And Google calculates that in 0.58 seconds. And what happens? Nine in 10 people click on a result from the first page of Google. There is actually a joke that says if you kill someone, the easiest way to hide the body is on page two of Google. Because no one goes there, right? So everyone clicks on the result from the first page. But the thing is, did you make that decision or did Google make that decision for you? Did Google push you or nudge you by putting the results on the first page to allow you to click on that result? That is a nudge. It is a digital nudge. So if you click on the first page, you've been digitally nudged. But what I do is I also ask other people because I don't want to rely on my decision making just from Google. So I asked the uh, organizing committee from GoTo, like, where should I go? And Barra and Anna Sophie, they recommended I should go to this place, the signature place on level 96. And I went there yesterday and I met Vera. Where is Vera? She's here. No, she was here yesterday and she recommended that I should go to this place, the Baha'u Temple. She was asking if it was on my agenda. She's there, right? Vera. Yeah, so thanks for doing that. I'm actually going to try and visit that place because it wasn't in my agenda and it wasn't on page first of Google, right? So that's my recommendation is don't rely fully on the digital recommendations because they are biased and you don't want to make all your decisions based on that. Just like a GPS device, you are in place A, you want to go to point B, do not fully delegate that in your life to a digital device because maybe a GPS is good at finding the right route for you to get to point B, but not everything in your life. Do not do that without critically thinking about the decisions you're making. Otherwise, you will end up just like those guys who said that they were following the GPS and the GPS kept telling them to go and go and they went into the ocean blindly, just like following a GPS uh, advice without questioning it, without the critical thinking. Yuval Noah Harari talks about the rise of dataism. And there is a question whether that's a threat to freedom or if it's a scientific revolution. What is dataism? We went from theism, which is back in the days we would go to a religious leader and ask for advice. Let's say you wanted to make a decision of who you should marry or where you should travel to or something big in your life. Then you would go to a religious leader and you would ask for advice. That's the theism. Or you would read some religious book. And then we went to humanism which is we would go within and you would say, ask yourself, like ask yourself, what do you want? And the answers are inside of you. And Yuval mentions now that we moved into the dataism, which is we are delegating those decisions to the data. So we go to Google and then we ask for things and we do whatever Google tells us. We want to meet someone and you go on Tinder and then whatever recommendation shows up, then you right swipe and you are getting the recommendations from that app and think about what decisions you are delegating to data and also which data you are giving in order to get those recommendations back. And that is dataism. And questioning as well whether that's a good thing or not. So let me talk about the first book, which is Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, it was mentioned yesterday, it's one of my favorite books ever. And Daniel Kahneman is a Nobel Prize winner for that concept of the system one and system two brains. And I actually want to run an experiment with you, right? As you can see, I'm making you think a lot. So I'm going to ask you a question, and please say very loud the first thing that comes to your mind. And if you already know, it's okay, you will know the answer. But if you don't, try to answer with the first answer that comes to your mind, right? So you have a bat and a ball, and the bat and the ball together, they cost $1.10. The bat is $1 more expensive than the ball. How much is the ball? There you go. Someone said five cents, but the majority said 10 cents. What happens is when we think fast, and that's the Kahneman's concept, then we make mistakes because we don't make all the calculations that are needed to validate that that number is correct. So 10 cents, if it was 10 cents, 
then the bat would be $1 more expensive, which is 110, and the total is 120. But when you think about it using your system two, when you think slow, then you go like, ah, the ball is five cents, and the bat is $1 more expensive, 15, and the total is 110. So that is the mistakes that we make when we use our fast brain, our system one that takes shortcuts. And it's very, very simple to visualize that because which just happened with the majority of us. Something else, I will say something and I want you to say a word, which is the first word that comes to your mind when I say this, right? Australia. Could I, like, read your brain? A lot of people said kangaroo, the slide was here. So this is when I say I can hack your brain, is because the stereotypes and the shortcuts that we make are very predictable. As it was mentioned yesterday as well, like biases are predictable. This is a predictable bias, which is uh, the stereotype of a country. We make shortcuts, and kangaroo is probably the simplest and the fastest word that we can remember when we talk about Australia. But Australia is a complex country, right? It, everything that is complex, our brain tries to simplify with shortcuts. It's very complex, of course, there are kangaroos there, but it's not everything that happens there. And I've lived there for a while. I love Australia. It's an amazing country. But I'm originally Brazilian. And you also have your stereotypes about Brazil. Yesterday, someone was asking me, do you play soccer? And I don't. And they were like, what? Are you a Brazilian who doesn't play soccer? And I was like, yeah, I'm sorry. And I got that a lot as well in Australia, right? People would invite me to the soccer clubs. And I would be like, I don't play soccer. But that's a stereotype. Some people would think that Rio is the capital of Brazil, and it's Brasilia, but when I went to Australia, I also thought that Sydney was the capital, so I also have my stereotypes. I'm also biased. We are all biased. And as a name, right, when you think about Pelé, first thing that comes to your mind is soccer player. But well, maybe someone in Brazil has a cousin called Pelé. And what happened to me was, my name is Fabio, right? So in Australia, every time I would say my name was Fabio, people would laugh at me. And I wouldn't understand why, because I was coming from Brazil and my name is very common in Brazil. And then I was like, why are you guys all laughing? Because my name is Fabio. And they were like, yeah, because of Fabio. And I was like, what, what Fabio? And then they were like, this Fabio. <laughs> so I was like, okay, that, that's the stereotype, right? Think fast, connections in your brain, the first thing that comes to your brain. I actually tried really hard to become a bit more like that. This is the closest I got. <laughs> and this is go to Chicago that we had remote in the middle of the COVID pandemic. Yeah, and I tried. I hope you didn't watch that because <laughs> that was really bad. So I come from a very small town. I grew up in a 30,000 people town in the northeast of Brazil. And I had this dream to just get to know the world. I knew that there was a lot more in the world than just those 30,000 people that we almost like knew everyone around us. And then I went, to, um, I went to Australia to work for ThoughtWorks as a technologist. And then I still remember when I watched Black Mirror for the first time, and I was like, wow, that's very futuristic. And right around the time when this uh, Black Mirror episode came out, I was at Thoas, and Thoas was actually releasing something very similar, which was this smart mirror project that was done in Singapore. Alexa, start the bank. How can I help you today? Alexa, show me my balance. You have $3,390 in your current account. So even now, that looks very innovative, right? Very revolutionary for you to wake up and look at your mirror and say, how much do I have in my account? Maybe make a bank transfer via voice and looking at your mirror. And that was, I guess, 2015, 2016. And I'm very proud that I worked for Thorwix for 10 years doing um, innovation. And right now, I work for Red Hat as the head of innovation for Latin America. But as I said, I was in Australia 2016 and remember, we make 35,000 decisions every day. I had to make one very big decision in 2016, which was to go back to Brazil, because my mom had been diagnosed with cancer. And then I had to make that decision whether I would continue at Thorwex in Australia or if I would go back. 
And I went back and I don't regret that decision at all because I've always done very good things for her and I've always made her very happy. And that's how surprised she was when I showed up, like uh, coming back. Yeah, but that is one of the decisions I made. So think about 35,000 every day, but there is one decision that changes your life, which is going back from one country to the other because of a person in your family, right? I'll get back to that at the end. Let's talk about another book, Predictably Rational. Who knows Dan Ariely here? Who's read that book before? I read this book and it totally transformed my life. Just like Linda has transformed a lot of lives, the Dan Ariely's book has transformed my life. And this book talks about the fact that we are irrational in a predictable way. And it's all about the biases. To be honest, I guess out of the three, it's the simplest one to understand human irrationality. And Dan has a good comparison with optical illusion. When you look at those squares A and B, can you tell that the square A and the square B are from the same color, the same shade of gray? It doesn't look like it, right? It looks like A is darker than B. But that's because around A there is light and around B there is shade. So what's around things affect the way we see things the same way that what's around things affect the way we make decisions. So when you look at it like this, you can see it's really the same shade of gray. So I looked at it and I was like, oh my God, my brain, my brain is bugged. <laughs> and it is bugged. Not only in an optical illusion way, but it's bugged in many ways. This research is a number that in Denmark it's 4% and in Austria it's 99%. I asked once, what do you guys guess this is? And someone was like, oh, it's the number of Austrians. <laughs> Very clever. It's the number of organ donors. Why is it that in Austria you have almost 100% of people as organ donors and in Denmark only 4%? Because of something called the default. The default is the decision that's already made for you and you don't have to do anything. I call it the do nothing decision. And there is a bias for that. It's called the status quo bias or the default bias. Pretty much when you choose a setting on your phone or on an app that you're developing or let's say the default variable uh, value that you're setting to a variable, be sure that the majority of people will not change that. So be very conscious about your defaults. And that's all the, the research that has been done on all the, the countries where the default is that you are an organ donor, where you have to opt out, then the majority of the people can't be bothered. It's a big decision, right, for you to decide whether you want to be an organ donor or not. So you would think people would make that conscious decision and go there and actually say yes or no, but the default just takes over completely. It's unbelievable. And since we build software and we build applications and we build technology, what are the digital defaults? All those things that you see online on forums and applications, they have the default. Because think about something like that. It's a checkbox that says, I do not want to receive emails. What happens on the do nothing situation? You receive emails, right? So if you don't do anything, if you do nothing, you are saying that you want to receive emails. Of course, like legislation came along like GDPR, and in Brazil, we have one that's LGPD. And they all think about something and they, they say that you need to give explicit consent, especially when it's something related to your personal data. But it's not everything. We still build apps with a lot of defaults. I was using Uber when the pool functionality came along. And the pool functionality came as a default. I was requesting an Uber and the pool option was pre-selected by default. And I didn't even know what it was. And in fact, I like to talk to Uber drivers and one Uber driver said that this lady asked for an Uber pool and she arrived at the, the car and there was another passenger and there, she was like, what? I just ordered Uber. And the guy was like, you ordered Uber pool. And she was like, I ordered what? So she didn't even look at what she was ordering because we don't think about anymore the things we're doing. We just go next, 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 next. And you end up choosing the defaults that the applications chose for you. So be very conscious about defaults because that is a powerful thing. I'm going to talk to you about another experiment that Dan Ariely mentions on his book, which also influences people's decisions. This was done with the selling of a subscription from the magazine, The Economist. So you had three options, digital subscription, 
print version 125 or print plus digital for 125. And then what happens? Majority of the people get the 125 and nobody gets the 125 print version only. Why would you get print version only if you can get both for the same price? And then they go like, okay, nobody chose this option in the middle, so we're gonna remove it. And that's why I like the concept of the scientific method, which is running uh, A-B tests and actually having two groups of people trialing things with double blind experiments. And then they ran an experiment with, without the option in the middle, since nobody chose it. Why, is it. why should it impact anyone's decisions? But if you remove the option in the middle, then the majority of the people buy the $59 one. And why is that? People actually didn't want both. They just went for the combo because it looked better. So if you want to make something look better in an equation, in a formula, there is a way to do that. You add a decoy option to the formula. The formula is, if you have A and B, and you want someone to choose option B, you add an, a minus B option. Minus B makes B look much better. And that is called framing. It's a way where you can actually nudge people into choosing option B because you just added option minus B. And because we have limited attention, which is one of the concepts of behavioral economics, we have limited attention. We don't consume all the information that we see because it's too much. And what's around us influence our decision, then people go and choose option B. And it happens all the time. Like I kept seeing those biases everywhere and I kept seeing people frame decision making to me. And I was like, okay, buying an iPhone, $6.99, the most expensive one. And then you add like two more, like Pro Max, more expensive. And then suddenly the $6.99 doesn't look too expensive anymore because now it's not the most expensive. When you're choosing something on a menu, people go to, let's say you're buying wine on a wine menu there is the middle option bias, which is people don't want to buy the cheapest wine or the most expensive wine, so they go for something in the middle. So a lot of restaurants, they actually add very expensive wines that sometimes they don't even have, just so you buy the, the cheaper version. I was working for an insurance company, and then they were choosing which cover should be sold to someone as, a, as an insurance for people who had, let's say, equipment, like a camera. And then there were way too many options of coverages that they should buy. At the end of the day, the user would end up with 511 different options. And then I was working with great UX people at that time, and they were like, what if we do digital personalization based on the information that we're getting and based on which covers those professions should be buying, then we only show them three options as combos. And that was when I realized that the UX people were using the same concepts as what I had read on the Predictably Rational book from Dan Ariely. And I was like, wow, there's like behavioral economists talking about this one thing, and then UX people are doing the same thing, but sometimes they don't even know that they are using those concepts. But sometimes they do know, right? Netflix has the functionality of autoplay, which is very similar to the do nothing situation. If you do nothing, you keep watching. And that is using your default Amazon patented something called anticipatory shipping, which is they will send you something before you buy it. And of course, there will be something like, okay, you can return if you don't want it, but by understanding your behavior of search, then you can receive something that you haven't even bought. So that's the do nothing situation happening again. The default is you receive the thing, and then sometimes you can't be bothered to return. So that buy decision is not made by us anymore. And who's a UX person here? Who, who works with UX or CX, customer experience or user experience? You have a lot of power. There is a lot of power in the hands of UX people because you get to decide how people will make those decisions on your products. And behavioral economists talk about decision architects and UX people are the digital decision architects. I like this quote that says that a designer who doesn't understand human psychology is going to be no more successful than an architect who doesn't understand physics. So you do need to understand human behavior, and that's why the word behavior is very important. I like the, the, what they did at Lemonade, which was a startup in San Francisco. Uh, they did some things very revolutionary. They had the, the, the fastest claim ever done that was a three-second claim have you ever had a claim approved in three seconds from an insurance company? 
It was all done via automated systems and artificial intelligence. And what they had was a behavior lab. And who was heading that company? Dan Ariely. So Dan was the chief behavioral officer at Lemonade. If you work for a company who really cares about human behavior, you have a CBO. Do you have a CBO in your organization? Or do you care about human behavior so much that you would have someone look at behavior in such a, a serious way? So I got to, uh, to, to meet Dan in 2014. He was in Brazil for the World Cup. And then a friend of mine bumped into him at a cafe. And he's not like that well known, like uh, Elon Musk. And then someone, my friend was like, oh my god, you have no idea who I met at the cafe, Dan Ariely. So he was very approachable. And as of that day on, he ended up uh, giving me advice and mentoring me on some of the things I did in my life. And I want to show you how a, a one-minute audio just changes everything because I was writing the book and I wanted to write the book about a talk that I was giving at the time, which was how cognitive psychology explains agile. And then he said, don't go with the agile because it's too niche. Just talk about the digital interactions altogether because it's much bigger than just the agile. And this is the audio that he sent me. Hi, Fabio. Uh, so I think that the digital world it has a few interesting uh, changes. I'm sure that people think differently when they see a digital um, interface. And, and here you can even say that different digital interfaces are different. You could think about different chapters that each focuses on what is different from in this uh, technology approach for good and for bad and think about what you would do differently because of that. Um, so let me know what you think. Bye. Yeah, and I had three titles for the book. I was either going to call it Digitally Irrational, for the Predictably Irrational, or I was going to call it Clicking Fast and Slow. <laughs> and one of the chapters of the book is called Clicking Fast and Slow. And then I decided to call it Digital Nudge, because the, the, the word nudge kept really like, when I was giving talks, people really liked the concept of the nudge. And so speaking of nudge, let me talk about nudge, book from Kassenstein and Richard Taylor. Taylor got the Nobel Prize in 2017 as well for the theory. And nudges are small and powerful interventions in the environments where we make decisions. And that could be a physical environment or it could be a digital environment. Right? So nudging someone, nudge is interesting because it's a word that doesn't exist in Portuguese. So in Portuguese, we only have push and touch, but there is no nudge. But nudging is, you feel, just nudge someone on your, who's sitting next to you. There you go, that's a nudge. So I couldn't understand that because the word doesn't exist in Portuguese. And then I started what I call a movement, which is the digital nudge movement. And I have two groups of people that I talk to. The digital citizens, who are everyone who live in the digital world. And what I try to do with the citizens is to raise consciousness and raise awareness. And with the digital decision architects, what I try to do is I try to teach them how to nudge for good. And that's the book. And the funny thing, as I said, in Portuguese, there is no nudge word. So one person came to my talk and they were like, oh, now I know what you're talking about. I thought this talk was going to be about nudes. <laughs> and they actually took a photo covering the G, so it ended up in digital nude. Uh, in fact, if you go to Google and you search for Fabio nudge, you will get a lot of content from me. Do not search for Fabio nudes. I have no idea what's going to come back. Maybe the, the blonde guy. The, the <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, so I called the book in Portuguese uh, Digital Consciousness because there was a point in time when I was going through a very hard moment and then I went to a spiritual retreat with Eckhart Tolle, the author of the book The Power of Now, and I got to have this conversation with him where I asked, how could we use technology to expand our consciousness, right? I worked with technology, and I actually, um, I was quite, it was quite interesting to hear you talk about technology a few times in the past couple of days, um, and the way that you mentioned that smartphones are actually an extension of our minds. And the I'll follow up a little bit because of time, but then I ask him, how can we use technology to help us expand our consciousness and be more present? And then this is his answer. If you want to learn about human unconsciousness, you want to learn about the human ego, just go there and read what people post. 
be careful with what you put out there, what kind of thing you post. Give yourself a moment when you read something before you type in an answer or a comment. Give yourself a moment and go within and avoid uh, making people wrong. Techno yeah, if you want to watch more of that, there is a 16-minute video on his YouTube channel. Just YouTube search for technology and consciousness. It was a good conversation, and that inspired me to call the book in Portuguese Digital Consciousness. And I'm going to go very quickly through the five digital consciousness skills that I've mapped. Uh, we went straight to the third one for some reason. But first one is control. So have control over your decisions. Right? It's the first C of decision making. The second one is the, uh, the one about the connected and disconnected balance. Sometimes we get connected too much and we forget to connect with people who are sitting right next to us. So balancing things between your connection and your dis disconnection is also a skill. Being knowledgeable about the unconscious biases, it's also something that I believe that makes you better, a better digital citizen. So for example, what Netflix uses in terms of your autoplay, it is making you as a seamless experience for you to keep watching. Right? I want to mention this book as well called Friction. It's a very good book that talks about when you want someone to do something, then remove friction. So because Netflix wants you to keep watching, then they remove the friction of having to click next and having to click for you to watch in the next episode. And that is creating a seamless experience. I actually want to go to the Amazon Go uh, store that there is in Chicago here. But this is a seamless experience as well. You just walk in, get something, and you walk out. So removing friction is a way to also simplify your decision making because we want to make simpler decisions without having to spend too much cognitive load. So remember the little boy from the sixth sense who used to see dead people? I see biases. I see biases everywhere. And I see biases in myself as well. I am biased, we are all biased. And I believe that by seeing those biases and by being more aware of them, I can actually change my behavior. It is a conversation I was having yesterday with Lynn like, can, can we change our behaviors by being aware and conscious? And I believe so, I have changed my behavior by being more aware. And I've had feedback from people say, just because I've watched your talk or I read your book, I make better decisions. But it's really hard because the status quo bias is just one bias out of more than 180 biases that have been mapped. This is called the bias codex, which is all the biases that behavioral economics has mapped. Like the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is an effect that says when you have little knowledge about something, then you have a lot of confidence. You think you know a lot about a certain topic, but actually you know nothing, right? And then when you start learning that you don't know more about that, then your confidence level drops. Or the IKEA effect, which is when you build something, you feel like you own it and you're more attached to it. If you pair programming and you ask someone to change a variable name, you will feel how, how attached they are to the variable name because they built it. So by being aware of those things, it helps us because it helps with our interactions. So what I say is for digital citizens, we need to raise our consciousness and for digital decision architects, nudge for good. And a lot of people ask me, Fabio, can I manipulate people if I know those things? And I say, yes, you can manipulate people. And Nir Eyal, the author of the book Hooked, I actually translated his book to Portuguese and it was really hard to translate because the word hooked means addiction in Portuguese. And I wrote the preface, but on his book, he has something that he says that there are two types of influence. There is persuasion, which is influencing people to do what they want and what they need. And there is coercion, which is influencing people to do what they don't want and they don't need. So it's all about finding out what is it that people want and need. Harry Brignall created a website called Dark Patterns, where he maps some of the, the patterns of things that people do that nudge you towards bad decision making. He renamed the website recently into Deceptive Patterns. So what used to be called the Dark Patterns website is now the Deceptive uh, Patterns, I really recommend checking it out. And he's also publishing a book uh, soon. South by Southwest uh, conference was talking about the ethics behind AI, right? So I want to bring the morals and the ethics of what we do as technologists. 
The future of influence, right? How are we being influenced? Those are all talks from South by Southwest. Ethical digital design as a competitive ad advantage. People will choose your company because you're more ethical than others, right? So the word ethics and morals are appearing more and more. Has anyone watched this movie, Coded Bias? During my first semester at MIT, I got computer vision software that was supposed to track my face. It didn't work until I put on this white mask. I'm thinking, all right, what's going on here? Is it the lighting conditions? Is it the angle at which I'm looking at the camera? Or is there something more? That's when I started looking into issues of bias that can creep into technology. So not only humans are biased, we are training technology and the technology is becoming biased as well because we are training them without data diversity. This was the case, like the, the algorithm was trained with face recognition data that didn't take into account diversity. What I like about this is that we are raising awareness and there are things like Amazon SageMaker that detect bias and then we are being aware of the fact that some of the algorithms and the, the, the AI have been biased I spoke a lot about experiences, right? So, and as you can see, like experiences and emotions, it's something that we as humans, artificial intelligence doesn't have emotions, and we do. And it's one of the things that differentiate us from, from AI. And I went through this experience, so I really want to say, if you don't want to go through it, it's okay. Just sit still, don't close your eyes. But I do believe that we have such huge power inside of us and that emotions are transformative. Not only I say that, but that's neuroscience. Like the, the way we feel just changes our lives, for good and for bad, as we were saying yesterday. Someone can say a judge can judge something better or worse depending on how they're feeling. So what I want to do right now is I want to invite you into an experience that I went through, that I want you to feel the best vibrations and the best emotions that a human can feel. And if you don't want to go through it, I went through it. It changed my day and it changed my life. So I started doing it on my talks. It's, a, it's called the guided meditation. It takes three minutes and you just have to close your eyes and follow what I'm saying and that's it. But if you don't want to do it, feel free to just stand still. Let's create good experiences and let's use technology for good, everyone. Thank you so much, I'm Fabio.